Good day and welcome back to the 40OT podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. How are you guys doing today? Not gonna lie, past few weeks have been pretty rough for me. I've been going through some kind of weird mix of an autistic burnout and a period of depression. So I think it's very fitting that today's topic, we're going to be talking all about philosophy. Um, for anybody who doesn't know about my political, um, not political, philosophical affiliations, um, I'm very much towards the um, the existentialism kind of side of things. So it's going to be a really interesting chat with our guest, Emily. And Emily, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And uh, it's, it's lovely to have you on. Thank you. Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'm an artist. And let's see. Um, I've been writing since I was a kid. So that was kind of my first foray into the realm of of art. Yeah. I'm a f- filmmaker, a poet, a screenwriter, a journalist, and a songwriter. Wow. Think, and, f- fingers in many pies, as we say, say in the UK. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I love being a creator and being creative and supporting other creatives. And um, I also have a small writing business. So I coach writers. I work as a judge for a film festival sometimes or a script reader for film festivals. And I also, um, yeah, just coach people one-on-one with their screenplays. I'm starting a screenwriters chapter of the Writers League of Utah, um, which will be available for others outside of Utah as well, since it will be online. But um, yeah, so my recent work is um, writing directing and co-producing a short film called Love Spell that played in 14 festivals around the world and um, took home about 11 awards. So that was exciting. And since then, I've been focused on like finishing up some of my screenplays and um, short story writing and publishing poetry and short stories and some journalism as well. So just a bit, you know, just a little little bit of here and there kind of work. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, for, that's, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> it is. And I'm also putting out two songs this summer. Wow. So like, I know that there is like a, a, a really big like autism stereotype about Autistic people being very, very good with maths and computer sciences. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. And I've been doing a little bit of digging into like the common interests that autistic people have. And it seems to be like a lot of us gravitate more towards the creative kind of fields, like whether it's fantasy, you know, writing, art, things like that. It's, it's, it's been quite, quite eye opening just how wrong the stereotypes have been (laughs) yes in fact i attended a lecture or i guess it was more of a conversation recently with some people from i think nokia bell and google some female people in the like film world just talking about like changing stereotypes and this was more specifically towards women Mm. in film Mm. but in technology women in in technology or in stem fields stem fields and how they're portrayed or not portrayed in film and television and how we can change those stereotypes and um, more accurately represent how Mm. women are in those fields so I, i thought that was really cool I had a, um, an interview in the first season of my podcast with this uh, guy called Reggie. R- Reggie, Reggie Harold, Reggie Harold, something like that. And he's an actor and he does like a lot of theatre related things. And um, he was talking to me about, you know, I, I asked him, obviously, you know, have you, have you done any autistic roles? Do they just 
you know, hand them out on a silver platter to you because you're autistic. And he was talking about it and he's a very handsome chap and he's very kind of, you know, very mainstream kind of stereotypical, attractive man. And a, a lot of the autistic characters that he would want to go for, they actually don't fit like his physicality. Like they, they have like this, I think it's called like typecasting where they're looking for these kind of small geeky kind of people, men usually <laughs> to play autistic leads. And that's really concerning because it's, it's, it's not only that there is this stereotype that's around, but it's actually being propagated by a lot of like the the media, like the people who are um, casting people for these roles. Yes, I, I agree with you. And how can we change that? I think through having writers actively writing in characters who are not just stereotypes, but having writers on the spectrum, I think is really important for Hollywood to be open to that. And I, th I think there is definitely more of a leaning or an awakening to that need. I, I'm not sure how, how many people in the industry are, you know, actively working on implementing sure, that. Sure. I have, I have seen a little bit. I know that there's a actress called uh, Chloe Hayden, who I, I think it's, it's a bit like heartbreak high that she was, I, I didn't watch it. I'm going to be honest, but uh, it's not really that my kind of thing, drama, things like that. Sure. I'm more of the, like the uh, the cartoon kind of Rick and Morty type type of person. I like depressing. I like to watch depressing things like like Black Mirror. That's what that's what really helps me relax in the evening. <laughs> oh, I love Black Mirror. That's the kind of stuff yeah. I write too. Have you, have you watched the uh, the latest season? <laughs> yes, and I've watched a bit. I watched a bit of it. I watched like the first three episodes. What did you think? I mean, it's, it's it's very different. Like the thing that I like about Black Mirror is that you you don't really know exactly what you're going to get with each of the episodes. Like I think the one with the um, the 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 Asian girl that's kind of themed around like a, a 1940s, 50s kind of movie um, aesthetic. Mm -hmm. uh, where she, where she she puts like a, a bit of a blood on on like a talisman and she has to go about like sacrificing people to prevent the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen that episode yet. That sounds really good. Okay, sorry. I I just yeah. I should really okay. put like a sp a spoiler yeah. alert on like things like this. But oh no, you're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> the episode where the girl finds out that her life is in a or is a TV show or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wrote D something similar to that. Yeah. <laughs> You've had something similar to it? I wrote something, I think in 2015, that was kind of similar to that. But uh, That's cool. yeah, it was kind of like a, she, she had a job as an influencer, this character, and she gets like sacked one day. She just gets a letter in the mail basically saying that um, the corporation that she worked for, you know, doesn't need her anymore and everything is let her go, but she doesn't realize they have cameras in her apartment and they've been filming other elements of her life that she does not want to reveal, like what medication so she like takes in the, and things like the, that. The um, small print on the, on a contract or something. Exactly. And then mm. she finds out that they own her image but she's poor and now she's like sitting outside the shopping mall and people are working, walking by with shopping bags with her face on it. But of course she's not making any money. That's crazy. Yeah. That sounds good. Thank well, you. Um, Maybe I'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that I'm wondering is, you know, you've, you've obviously list, listed off quite a lot of things. You've, you've told me that you do um, screenwriting for films, you do poetry, you do writing you coach people like i feel like we're very similar in the in in that way that we like to have lots of different things to do all the time lots of productivity related yes. things how do you 
schedule that? <laughs> How do you like <laughs> make sure that you 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 like water each of the plants or spin the plates on each of them? That's a great question. Okay, so part of my challenge being neurodivergent is that I really have a hard time scheduling specific times for specific things. It could be anything from like, I don't know, if neurotypical people say, okay, I eat every day at one o'clock and then I go to the gym at five o'clock or whatever. I have a really hard time with setting timed events, you know? So I would say, Mm -hmm. you know, part of it is just keeping a calendar and like I have a physical calendar and I have reminders on my phone, but I also use my notes to keep track of my goals. And then I might just tackle one thing at a time or sometimes depending on how I feel that day, how much energy I have left for the day, you know, I'll say, okay, well, what, what else can I accomplish today? And, you know, then that's what I end up doing for the day. That's really interesting. It's not like the typical idea of like the autistic routine with things. Like for me, it's, it's very much like that. Well, it, it, it kind of is because if I don't, follow this set routine in my head each each day and go for each each of the different things then i i just find that my anxiety is just too difficult to manage like i have a, i have a lot of different things that i want to maintain and do and it seems like sometimes like when your energy is low and you have you know you start it and you have all this energy and you want to do all of these things and then you commit to each of these things and then you have to when your energy lowers you've got to maintain them you've got to keep doing them and <laughs> right. I, I find that balance really really hard to strike sometimes mm-hmm. like am i being too productive or too unproductive for for how i like you know interesting yes i mean i i, I would say i do have my own routines but they're not quite like that you know it's like i'll have my coffee at a certain it's not necessarily the certain time every day it's not really time based mm. it's just like i do have i have certain things worked into my routine or like meditation practice but meditation's big like i uh my my degree was in biomedical sciences and when i was doing that i uh i did a lot of research into meditation i was trying i was trying very much at that period of my life to fix my brain you know with all the the mental health difficulties that i have to to deal with i i'd been going through psychotherapy rates since i was 14 uh to no result really and so i kind of i was looking for ways to sort of improve myself and one of the aspects one of the ways that I wanted to do that was meditation. And it actually does like have physical changes on your brain. Like I think I think they did like a, a research study on monks and like compared their brains to the brains of people who don't meditate as much. They meditate like two or three hours a day or something. And they showed like growth in, in certain areas of the brain uh, just from doing meditation over and over each day for like years. Um, I think it was to do with like the the prefrontal cortex, maybe, maybe reduction of the amygdala, which is the prefrontal cortex is what we consider to be like the center of our like higher intelligence and brain, our decision making. Uh, Whereas the amygdala is kind of this, you know, monkey mind kind of emotional brain that just keeps us safe and, you know, makes makes us feel the anxiety and the fear and things like that uh, which is important for survival but it's not not so good in our in a mod- modern time and um so meditation you know like it's it's definitely like proven to be effective for a lot of people that's awesome i can ag- agree with that <laughs> and attest to that but i do what's uh, your schedule like well i do a specific it's not necessarily, I mean, I do meditations as well using an app 
that I really like called Moon X. But also I do Gongyo every day, which is part of my Buddhist practice with SGI. And I, I'm not familiar with, with those terms. Okay, so SGI is an organization that uh, began in Japan under Nishiren. And let's see if I can give you a little background on it. <laughs> it's based on the, the teachings of the 13th century Japanese monk Nishiren. Mm -hmm. um, it's distinctive for its focus on the Lotus Sutra as the ultimate Buddhist scripture. Um, our central practice is chanting the mantra Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, which loosely translates to I devote myself to the Lotus Sutra or I devote myself to the mystic law of cause and effect, basically through sound or through vibration. And by chanting the mantra, um, we believe that we can tap into our inherent Buddha nature in our own lives and discover our highest potential. So I'm just having a look at the uh, the website. It says that uh, the word the word gongyo literally means to exert oneself in practice. Uh, one gongyo is a short ceremony which enables us to celebrate our inherent Buddhahood. I love that word <laughs> and too. offer prayers of gratitude and determination for for whatever is relevant to us at any particular time. Yes. Yeah. So can you read Japanese or do you have like a uh, Yeah, so I have my book and it is in Japanese, but it also has wow. the English translation in the beginning. So we actually chant in Japanese every day from two chapters of the Lotus Sutra. The second That's awesome. And the sixteenth chapters, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so we do um, gongyo, but I also just chant nam myoho renge kyo if I feel I need to during the day. And that's had a profound impact on my life. I feel more peaceful and more grounded when I do my chanting. And it usually just takes about five to 10 minutes a day. So it's not a huge time commitment, but the effects that it has on my life, I felt substantially. Awesome. Well, about, I suppose that leads us into kind of like the, the topic of the podcast. A little bit of, of a background for me. Obviously, we're going to be talking about like philosophy. Um, that's going to include things like religion, but it's also going to include things like, what would you say? What's what's the word for not non-religious? Oh, <laughs> it could be. Humanism, about, maybe. Hu humanism. There, there is like a word for it, isn't there? Word for not being religious. <laughs> Secular. There you go. If I if I just give you a little bit of a background for sort of my my experience with religion, uh, my my parents, well, my mom is um, describes herself as Christian, kind of more towards like the agnostic kind of side of things. Whereas my dad is like a diehard atheist, and I've been to church a few times in my in my life. I had a Catholic friend who I went to the ch the church with them once. Um, they told they told me that anyone who didn't believe in God uh, was going to go to hell, and that they were inherently an evil person. And so I I told my dad after swimming practice one time that I'd been to this church, and they told me that he's evil. And uh, he wasn't very happy about that. So um, he he uh, he, exp he explained to me about like, you know, what religion is and and how, you know, just because someone tells you that something is a certain way, it doesn't always mean it. And everyone has their own kind of different beliefs, uh, ways of interpreting the world. Um, his being kind of the more atheistic kind. I, I did have quite a big interest in Buddhism when I was younger. I think it's more about like the the, the teachings of it, like non attachment, like not not being as a, as a, as attached to things in your life, 
and so not not experiencing the the pain when something bad happens with it or you don't have that thing in your life anymore that that was kind of one of one of the things that i saw and it was also you know i i kind of i, I suppose I, I very much like the aesthetic of it and like the focus around peace and serenity and kind of meditation and things like that is so i did i did a bit of research into it kind of into i did a, a philosophy and ethics uh, course at my school uh learned a bit more about kind of the the roots of of buddhism but i think i think mostly for for a lot of my life i've been fairly secular with things you know i don't i don't believe that there is an afterlife i don't believe that there is a um supernatural being um i don't you know i i firmly root myself in what i know and what i don't know and what i don't know i don't think about um so that's that's me <laughs> um i i would really like to to know obviously from from your side because i remember you saying that you grew up in quite a religious kind of conservative environment which was you know my upbringing was was not so much like that so i guess like what role did religion play in your life then and what kind of strayed you away from those those teachings that you had when you were younger yeah that's a great question um and, and i definitely admire you for not uh having a religious doctrine too because i think well we'll get into this in a second but <laughs> i i have very strong views i guess um because of my upbringing about religion and kind of its role sure. in people's lives and things like that so i grew up in a small conservative christian community in the bible belt um i was raised in tennessee on the border of virginia and christianity was my entire life i was also homeschooled so even our small homeschool classes with a few other children were with kids from church. We met inside of a church building for most of our classes, and therefore most of my social interactions were with people from either my church or other churches in our homeschool network. Sure. It, was, it was a large network, a large community, and I would just say, yeah, religion was just deeply woven into our lives. It did sure. provide a moral compass, a community of shared values and beliefs. But personally, you know, as I matured and began to grow and expand and move out of that community, um, I really started to question and explore. I felt that I needed to find a path that resonated more deeply with me as a creative person, as a woman, as a I identify as, as bisexual, so as a bisexual woman, um, and definitely as doesn't, a doesn't tend to be things that Christianity is very up for. <laughs> yes, exactly. And most, you know, all of the leaders that I knew were male. Sure. So there's that element of not feeling ever that my voice was heard or wanted. <laughs> Sure. Growing up um, in that in that realm, yeah, just so. kind of kind of forced, well, not forced, but expected to kind of sit the side and you know listen rather than contribute. Exactly, and you know, I, I was shy growing up, and so I would just kind of escape into my own head or my own world a lot of times, using my imagination. I felt like I, you know, maybe I, sometimes I would go to a different place, <laughs> yeah. um, which was a lot more comfortable than being, being there in, in church uh, every Sunday. And then, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the, the other women in the community were usually in the kitchen, like cooking when we would have sure. like church potlucks, they would be cooking in the kitchen and then the men would be out like discussing philosophy or whatever they did. But I just remember wanting to be around the men, <laughs> not yeah, having yeah. any desire to be in the kitchen. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like like you you were saying that you identify as, as bisexual. Like Yes. When did when did you kind of get get those those feelings that you, you might sort of be attracted to other women? And like cause cause I imagine, you know, being in that kind of community where you're homeschooled and you kind of fed a lot of these um doctrines and ideas about how you should conduct yourself in the world that it, it might be a little bit hard to kind of accept those feelings but like what what age did you kind of think about that or when did you kind of notice that you that you had that kind of attraction to to women um i think it was about 10 or 11 when i first felt like a physical attraction to women it wasn't until high school that I experimented <laughs> and then college I had like a, sure. a girlfriend and stuff. So yeah, but it definitely, it took years of, especially I remember one of my best friends growing up said, yeah, anyone who has sexual attraction to the same sex had um, some kind of deep trauma in their past. Yes. And so when I heard that, I thought I was like, oh, so that's the explanation <laughs> for my feelings. You know, it, it just I don't know. I um So they 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 didn't go with the like homosexuality or or anything about that is evil and you're going to go to hell or all that. It's they they actually like said it's caused by like trauma. Yeah, I mean, that's what I heard, but then also there wasn't really any discussion on homosexuality. So it wasn't like something that my family ever brought up. And there were certain things that were never discussed. And then later on, I found my parents had these books about, you know, homosexuals are going to hell. And and I do remember that was something that my Jesus. mom did tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. She said, you know, homosexuals are going straight to hell. And anyway, she said something else about the chain IHOP being bought out by two gay men. And anyway, I just, I, that was like the only reference to anyone who might be LGBT mm -hmm. when I was growing up. And then I saw someone who I thought might be gay in the mall once when I was like 10. And I thought, I wonder how he feels <laughs> living in this community. But yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, is, is Tennessee like a, cause I, I'm not very, well, I'm not very good with UK geography. I'm not, I'm not good with American geography, like, and understanding which states are what kind of political affiliation, but I mean, is it, is it, is Tennessee like a, a really conservative state? <laughs> yes. Yes. Extremely. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They wanted to ban drag and things like that recently. So. Damn. Yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate. Of course, hopefully, you know, I mean, th things are, well, I, I don't want to get too much into the politics of it now because it's pretty depressing, but I would say it's similar to maybe a state like Florida where we right. have really atrocious people and policies mm. right mm. now. Mm. Sorry, Yes, I, I think I know what you're talking about. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's also been quite concerning for me so obviously you know religion was kind of a centerpiece for your in your life whether you liked it or not i mean what things made you stray away from it like was there like a moment or certain things or people in your life that have kind of influenced well not, i wouldn't say, I would like to say influenced i think that that kind of holds some like negative connotation but I mean, influenced in a nice way, like opened your mind, maybe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, my faith began to waver when I started meeting people of different religious backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And as I learned, and this was mainly in, in college, I was also, I went to a Christian college for my freshman year, and I was actually bullied by some of the students and I felt kind of like an outcast. And so, what was that? 
I'm sorry to hear that. It's oh, it's um, bullying and it's it's very it's very damaging, isn't it? Like it's it's difficult in the moment, but it also I think it really does hold a lot of like psychological significance, like going into adulthood and stuff. Like I know there's still experiences that I my brain kind of travels back to in negative moments in in my adult life where I'm like you know it really kind of affects me i think i think a lot of my mental health came from from bullying as well i'm sorry to hear that and yeah i mean that experience really did change my view i i already had kind of a negative view of christianity from my upbringing but then on top of it going to you know quote unquote christian school where basically they were just very snobbish and hmm. um, I mean, obviously not all of the students, there were some good students there too, but in general, I would say. <laughs> Did your cat, cat go in and say hello? <laughs> okay. Do you want to pause it for a second and I can. No, no, no it's fine. Don't okay? worry about it. Okay. Yeah. I, Fox, will you get down, please? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> She's, she wants attention. <laughs> fair enough yeah but just in general there was kind of a exclusionary policy towards you know the popular kids or those who went to that school and you know an an attitude of we're better than like the public school Mm. kids or something and that was something that i grew up with as well being homeschooled that i remember kids on the playground outside and I I remember specifically one of the deacon or el- I think it was the elder's son was taunting the kids next door who lived in the house next to the church who wanted to come over and play on the playground. And he said, uh, you're not Christian. You can't come over and you're poor and stuff like that. You know, it was just terrible. So, you know, that that's the kind of attitude like holier than thou that I really can't stand. Mm. <laughs> And, you know, it, it can, it's not, I, I think it's just a human behavior. I don't necessarily ascribe it to Christianity or any particular religion, but I but I think it, it's definitely, it can be a result of religions that claim, you know, our way is the only way. And so sure. that was, that, that Specific was. Specific like communities and. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and believing in Jesus is the only way to, to heaven or to peace that you know that that specific view is actually what began to crumble my christian faith so you know I, it, here's the the question you know as i learned more about the diversity of different human cultures around the world different religious practices different belief systems i began to question if god is love how could he condemn all of these people who don't believe the exact same rigid thing I was brought up to believe. Mm -hmm. You know, these people didn't grow up in my tiny community in a Reformed Protestant household, attending a Reformed Presbyterian church. You know, why why are they wrong? So that question nagged at me for years, and the construct of Christianity's so-called superiority began to crumble for me uh, as well during my college years as I studied different philosophies. I learned more about the world. And, you know, outside of my own bubble, basically. And it was illuminating. Hmm. In college, I also read Jacques Ellul's work on universal salvation, which uh, deeply resonated with me. And he basically says, you know, if God is all loving and there is nothing that exists outside of God, then basically like hell doesn't exist. And this, you know, if, if God says like, I love everyone and you know, we are saved through grace, then the grace covers everything and it doesn't yeah. matter what sin you've done. And so his concept There's a of, lot of like thing things, contradictions and stuff with with like Christianity. I mean, just going going back to my experience in philosophy and ethics, you know, that whole thing about God being all powerful, so you can they they can do anything all seeing 
they're aware of everything that goes on all the time and they're like it's like on omnipotent omniscient oh, it's the omni benevolent i think so all good all powerful all seeing i think that that was the point at which i was like you know i <laughs> The, the, what two of those can only exist because if it's all powerful and all seeing, it can't be all benevolent because there's a lot of horrible things that happen all the time. And if they're all all seeing and all benevolent, they can't be very powerful. If they're all if they're all powerful and benevolent, they can't see everything. So it's like this is stuff stuff like that. I think <laughs> is really really kind of cemented atheism deep in my brain. Yes. Like just just coming across stuff like that. Like, oh, I can understand. <laughs> I do understand. And yeah, and that, the whole thing about getting mm -hmm. forgiveness. Just have a horrible life. Do horrible things. Be evil. Like do all that, and then right before you die, just forget. Be forgiven, and go to heaven. <laughs> right. Yeah. I do, Sorry, I I, I'm I'm going on a bit of a roll with my atheism. I get very very passionate about it. That's okay. <laughs> I no, watch too bring, much Richard, Richard Dawkins sometimes, I think. <laughs> that's okay. And, you know, I think that's why I really like Buddhism because a lot, I also believe myself to be more of an existentialist in mm. my own philosophical understandings and personal ethos. What does um, existentialism mean? mean just for anybody who who doesn't doesn't know well personally i think it's about personal responsibility for one's existential choices or life choices and claiming personal responsibility that you know it's not god that's responsible or the universe or my parents or my environment but ultimately i am the one who is responsible for what happens in my life for the choices that I sure. personally make. There's it's a very scary, but it's also quite empowering. I think very freeing. Yes, yes, extremely freeing. Um, Soren Kierkegaard, John Paul Sartre, uh, Frederick mm. Nietzsche, Albert Camus, mm. um, Hi Martin Heidegger, Jacques Ellul, Hannah yeah, Arendt, yeah. Eric Fromm. Sorry, I'm listing all these, but these are some of my favorite philosophers. And while they have different focuses and mm -hmm. different you know views on you know the nature of humanity or the nature of god or uh human responsibility i think they do have some similarities like kierkegaard stresses personal responsibility for your uh, your life choices sartre highlights humans are responsible for their actions as they are quote unquote condemned to be free which mm. is kind of an interesting idea. Same with Nietzsche, you know, em emphasizing uh, the individual's role in shaping our own destiny. Mm. Camus advocates personal responsibility, but um, I think in the in the face of the absurdity of existence. So, you know, th there are yes. definitely similarities between them. Yeah. Well. The the um, existentialism is just I just googled what existentialism means and there's it's a nice little snippet of information that I'll probably read out. Uh, existentialism is a form of philosophical inquiry that explores the issue of human existence. Existentialist philosophers uh, explore the questions related to meaning, purpose, and value of human existence, which um, I think is. A very, very important thing. I did my my ears pick perked up when you when you talked about Nietzsche because um I think for for me I've I've always had a, a vested interest in like philosophy and um and ethics really. But it's I've never been particularly like studious about it. I think for a lot a lot of it for me. Um, when I went through my my sort of four or five year long um, period of time, where I was kind of writing uh, about my own personal experiences, thoughts, and and, and feelings behind things, uh, I actually kind of came to came 
very very close to the the way that like Nietzsche went with the whole the whole concept of like nihilism and things like that. Like I I've had a lot of experiences in my life where I've had pretty horrific existential crises where I could no longer assign any meaning to anything in my life. I think there was a long period of time for like a month and a half where I didn't do anything and I just kind of didn't see any point in in anything. And I've, I've had periods of time like that as well. And even situations where I kind of experience something and it's it's almost like my my eyes kind of zoom zoom out like it's the opposite of like tunnel vision and i kind of you know remember again about you know what that that feeling was like and so i think you know obvi- obviously I, I, things like depression and and negative life experiences ov- obviously lead you to seek some kind of clarity and certainty about the world and you know, for for me, that 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 was definitely the case, and I don't know if there's a specific like name for for this kind of thinking, but I kind of went went through this this weird stage where I was trying to figure out what what I could dis- like be certain on, you know, and um, and so I, I'd start with something something big. I was like. Right, I I I want to be to be good at taekwondo or something because that that's meaningful to me. And they kind of go down and uh, I, you know what underpins that, what under, underpins that, and what underpins that. And um, it eventually just kind of got to a situation where you know I was contrasting all of these thoughts and experiences that I was having with my knowledge of psychology with my knowledge of biology and the the fact that I am a secular person and I was kind of I kind of came to the the conclusion that there wasn't really anything that I could know for certain about anything if if I actually thought about it in the level of detail that I did you know <laughs> like sure. just 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 the physical act of thinking you know you're you're using a biological physical organ to think like there's obviously going to be particular biases from my experience in biology that prevent me from like thinking outside of that <laughs> like you know so there's there's always these 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 barriers in in my mind you know like well even though i've done all this thinking and i've kind of come up with my own meaning and philosophy and stuff i'm still just a human with a, a physical brain and there's there's so many things that I am unaware of that go on in my life and go on like in the world. You know, you have that that scientific study about your brain filling in gaps in the world and you you just kind of seeing this like most you get kind of hallucinating reality to a certain extent. Uh-huh. Because your brain is filling in so many of those gaps. And right. so so, so there's, a, there's a lot of that, and it's it's kind of this this mishmash of philosophy and science, and just constant writing and introspection. And I got to a point where I became very nihilistic, basically, and um, for a long time, even even when I was quite quite young, I had these existential crises. Like I remember when I injured my hand, I kind of looked at my hand, and I was you know really confused at why there was something stuck inside my body and trying to figure out what that meant you know um <laughs> i was a very weird kid <laughs> it's okay but um yeah that that kind of nihilism very much i i got to a point where i was like you know this is doing more to be destructive to me and although it feels somewhat freeing and you kind of feel somewhat superior because you, you you kind of don't feel like there's any meaning in anything and so whenever people ascribe meaning to things and get upset about things you're like you know it jokes on you no, nothing has any meaning uh, <laughs> um and i got to a point i was like tom like this is probably not going to be good for your mental health and um and so i decided at one point pro- 
at a time in Thailand, I was like, you know, I, I, I'm going to brainwash myself into thinking there is meaning. Um, I crafted like a few, like a core value, which was to be a positive influence on people in the world and, and also try and avoid, help people avoid pain. And that That's was wonderful. kind of the, the thing that I sort of grew off, I guess. It's, it's kind of wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely been good for me because it means that I'm not so focused on trying to fix myself and, and how I feel just to a certain extent. It's more kind of like an external meaning. Well, maybe that's what faith is, is just ascribing meaning to something. Having faith is believing even though we don't see anything or there's contradictions. Sure, sure. Even if realize it is that just I just rambled, but I, I have, <laughs> I have just like, um, like monologued about my my entire philosophy. I don't think there's anything else that I could really really talk about in terms of. Um, I've kind of just just unloaded everything. So I guess it, it would probably be good to I guess talk about, you know, the role of Buddhism, the role of spirituality in your life. So. When did you find like the concept of Buddhism and spirituality and what changes occurred in your life when you found it? Yeah, so I first discovered or was introduced to Buddhism through an Italian friend I met in Santa Barbara. We were working together on a political campaign mm -hmm. and she introduced me to the chant of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. That was, I think, in 2015. So even though I attended a few meetings in Santa Barbara and I had started to practice chanting, it wasn't until 2018 that I fully immersed myself in the practice by becoming a member of SGI in Salt Lake City and receiving my Gohansen, which is behind what, me What is right it? Go? Is that the, the black Al thing altar. on your wall or is that the, the altar? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. And it has a scroll inside, which is uh, which is inscribed with the Lotus Sutra and names of. I I hope I really don't butcher this. Bodhisattvas and um, other people <laughs> who are influential mm -hmm. in this Buddhism. Sure. So yeah, it's 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 a powerful thing. It's like uh, we describe it as a mirror, or um, Daisako Ikeda describes it as a mirror. Like uh, the mirror doesn't brush your hair for you, right? It doesn't do anything like that, but it does. It's a reflection. It uses light to reflect truth from your inner life, and so. Every morning we say we polish our mirror with the the chanting in front of the Gohansen, which is what I do. And it's and another important teaching is that basically it's not outside of me, it's inside sure. of me. So the power is inside of me. I'm not praying to some god or deity and saying, please help make my life better as I say my chants and my prayers. I'm calling within the power from within, inside of me, my own Buddhahood. And so that's why for me, it's very personally empowering. And yeah, so uh, anyway, outside of that, just in terms of kind of the trajectory of my practice, I would say, yeah, my I received the Gohans on, on International Women's Day in 2018 and shortly thereafter, I think it was like the next day or the day after we started filming my movie. And I will say it felt like the universal good was on my side. I had this immense sense of peace, sure. a feeling of groundedness, and the the filming went extremely well. And I, I felt in many ways that it was because of my practice and because of taking this leap of faith and joining. 
Personally, I've never been a person to like to join clubs or groups. <laughs> I think it's important for me to mention that also because I never want to offend anyone by saying, you know, I'm not going to sign up for this group or whatever. It's just because, yeah. You're an individualist. Yeah, and in, you know, social situations I have a hard time with. So it's a, it's just always a challenge whether it's church or another, just any any kind of group organization, so it, it was it was a big challenge for me, and I mm-hmm. had to let go of a lot of my own fears to join the organization and become part of the organization. But it, it definitely made a huge difference in my life. It empowered me to make my film, creating a positive experience for everyone on set, and one of the most significant transformations in my life as uh, becoming a Buddhist was the healing of my relationship with my father, which had been severely strained since my parents' divorce in 2003. So, you know, over the course of about 15 years of my life, our interactions often ended in arguments and hurt feelings. But I would say that the, the teachings that I obtained from my Buddhist practice, helped me develop compassion for my father. And I started to see him not just as my parent, but as a human being with infinite potential who had known great that's, suffering in yeah. his own life. That's that's a, re- a really, really sort of, I think, I think that's also kind of a, a point in which I came to when I was going through that, that period of time um, away in Thailand. I did like 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 you I kind of got to a point where I was like okay so my dad's my dad my mom's my mom I I've always seen them as this kind of all powerful kind of authority kind of you know super superhuman individual like not not like the other people that I see in my life and sure. so I did I did kind of get to a point like like yourself I was like oh this is you know they're actually a human being like <laughs> like anybody else that <laughs> mm-hmm. I met that like I may know them and they may have a bit more of this kind of uh parental bond with me and and want to support me in ways that perhaps other people won't do but I really started to kind of think about the way that I interacted with them and you know whether I was sort of affirming them whether whether I was supporting them in in certain ways I don't know if that came from my diving into my own brain about life, but it, it definitely did did happen at, at one point. And I kind of, you know, I fought very hard about it. I think it was around the, the passing of my granddad. He he, he died of uh, lung cancer while I was Sorry away. Sorry to hear that. And, no, he's, he's a lovely man. He's, he's absolutely, absolutely beautiful with me. He, he used to... Um, uh, <laughs> he used to come over and I used to like bring out like a pile of books and sit on his lap and, and go through this like massive stack of books with him and he'd just sit there and read them with me and whenever I was go- was going to a competition uh, whenever I got an award I would always come and see him and he'd have like a tear in his eye and he looked really really like happy for me and he always supported me monetarily which is something that my sort of my dad's side, granddad, parents didn't do. So he he was a very influential man on my life, and to me, he kind of, I think he cemented a lot of the my ideas and my my desire to to help people in into my head. You know, he, you know I I I was caught calling with him and my mom, and you know, he was he was kind of being. Uh, gradually increasing the dose of morphine that he was on, but uh, he, he managed to kind of, you know, he, he told me to stay in Thailand and he told me to to help people and he told me to learn, and and so that was kind of that was kind of that for me, and I was kind of already feeling like that would be something meaningful for me and something that I wanted to to grow on, and so um, yeah, that 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 happened and. Yeah, it's 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 strange, isn't it, when that that kind of that switch gets flicked, and you're like, oh, 
my parents are people. <laughs> yes, it is. It's it's very strange, but I read a quote once that said, you know, one thing that we can aspire to as children is to one day hopefully be friends with our parents, be mm, friends with our siblings. I like and that. Me too. So that was I think the what what happened with my father is that he was very religious and we would often get in arguments over things. And so I was able to focus on other areas that we could get along on sure. or have conversations about. Sure. And that was art. So, you know, part of our reconcil reconciliation was encouraging my father to return to his art. He was hesitant to do it at first. One visit, uh, when I came to to visit him at his house, he showed me all these art supplies he'd bought. He was hoping we would paint together, or I was hoping we would paint together. But then, um, when the moment came, when you know I had gotten all the paints out and I got our canvases ready, I said, "Dad, let's go paint." He said, "No, you paint." And he sat down and just started watching TV, and it was so depressing and it was so sad. And I could just sense that something else was going on under the surface. And yeah. I discovered later on. I think it was just another day I went to visit him. He started crying and he said, Emily, I, you know, he said, he told me about this traumatic experience he had. He, you know, went to art school. He got mm -hmm. his degree in art and he had this beautiful uh, easel and all of these wonderful paint supplies and canvases and all of his artwork. And he, he asked to leave it, I think at his parents' house in the garage or the shed or something. And, um, yeah someone in his family I think had donated or given all of the art supplies to like the Goodwill or given them away. And he was completely devastated. And I think that was a main reason why he didn't pursue art for, for a while. And, um, but after talking about it, like I helped him sign up for art classes at the local community college so he started taking art classes again he got really into it and his wife was really supportive and so they started doing art together like they would go on vacation and they would paint together and he you know when i'd come visit after that he would be like look look at what you know paintings we've done together they've revitalized the uh the passion it can, it can be very difficult when like, i think it's probably an experience that a lot of autistic people have just in general about you know, having these passions just kind of squashed by people in your life, it can it can really like, you know, people ascribe a lot to what you do and what you're interested in sometimes. Like, and it's um, it can be quite heartbreaking when you know it's something that you do a lot and it's kind of like this central part to your well, a part of your identity that you you do this kind of thing, and yes. uh, it's kind of disapproved of. Yes, and I always got annoyed when people would say, oh, your hobby, you know, or something like that. I'm like, no, you know what? I'm a writer, and that's, you know, even if I don't make a lot of money writing, it's part of who I am, and it's, you know, sure. it's a central part of my life, you know, more than some random job or something. But but I, but I, sure. I do agree with you on that. There's a book that I recommend – that you get or any listener here um, check out by Julie Cameron, the artist way is a really great book. Um, it's a workshop and can help kind of work through some of those blocks. And the book actually kind of came to me. It was gifted to me twice. And the first time I gave it away, I didn't read it. And then the second time a actress in LA that I know gifted it to me again for the second time. And I was like, you know what? I think this is some kind of a sign I should read this book. And so I did. And mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. then I've gifted it to other people and kind of kept Ho it. Hopefully kept they, it going. they, um, they do read it. They, they did. <laughs> not not kind of follow. <laughs> yeah, they did. Okay, good. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but yeah, no, well, I, I agree. And I, you know, back to like being creative and encouraging each other. I, I think this is why, 
the Buddhist philosophy works so well for me personally, and hopefully for other people out there as well, Mm -hmm. um, or who might be interested in it is it's about, um, personal empowerment and, um, also every day when I chant, I'm chanting for other people's happiness as well. So even if it's my ex or family members that I'm currently not getting yeah. along with, <laughs> I, I, you know, chanting that's, for their ultimate happiness and my own. That's, I mean, that's another thing, isn't it? It's um, like, I, th- I think that, that that's, it's, it's weird, like, uh, like the, the conclusions or like the thoughts that we've come to with like different ways like different different like methods or ways through through philosophy because that's that's also something that that kind of sprung on me at one point i was you know as i was saying before about like understanding my brain and thinking about all the limitations of it and stuff and the fact that i am quite secular i don't believe that there's like a spirit i don't believe that there is some kind of soul or anything i do just believe that we are kind of biological matter and you know i have having that belief i think although it can sound quite depressing to some people it really made me understand just like 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 people in general and be more kind of compassionate towards people because you know if i if i'm believing that you know what makes me up is my biology my genetics and my my experiences and my environment then how can i really be upset with people like who like about anything really like j- j- inside like you know it's not like i go about the world and i'm just accepting of everyone doing horrible things and things like that but i do have this general sense of you know understanding like the the human condition or the human nature fr- yes. fr- from my angle which helps me i think with with that idea of like forgiving and also you know wanting positive things for people um mm-hmm. just in, in my core it's not necessarily always at the surface but it's something that you know i i return to when i'm feeling particularly upset or angry or like discontented with 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 people in general <laughs> oh yeah and that that's been really transformative for me because it, it has allowed me to kind of be like right i get it this is you know how things go and you know that that's their life and their biology right and so so i have a bit more kind of compassion for 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 people despite what they're like with me and despite what they they, they, they do i guess mm-hmm that's great. And, you know, I, th- I think there is more of a connection between our views than one might think in the sense of, you know, maybe even spirituality is just science we haven't figured out yet. Possibly. Because, I'm definitely you know, open I, to that. <laughs> I am much more, you know, I do believe in a soul and spirit and um, universal energy and everything, but a lot of it intersects with physics and with um Hmm. theories you know scientific discoveries that we are learning about the nature of the universe and i mean you talk about biology but even biology is extremely complex and you know matter is extremely complex so i I think you know what you're saying is absolutely vital and important and even even if one only accepts i don't see like the the correct word for it but more more of a atheistic view of things i i still in my opinion believe that atheism is highly spiritual in the sense that humanity is incredible or being human or mm. being of the world is something remarkable and mysterious i mean it's- I took the, the like the big five personality test thing. It's like one of the the only kind of it's they use it in a lot of psychological studies and things like that to understand people and the world and the best kind of 
putting personality into boxes. It's not always the most like tasteful for a lot of people to use, but I'm very high in trait openness. And I think my kind of stance on things like that is that I'm not I'm not actively wanting to disprove things in, in that way. Perhaps things around very kind of you know, particular particularly kind of religious doctrines and, and things like that. But in terms of, you know, spirituality and stuff, I'm I'm very open to talking about it. It's just kind of the the way that I process and understand that stuff is is more you know it's 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 fun for me like it's like a fit like theories and oh okay i see I hope that doesn't sound offensive no not offensive at all no it's like you're an explorer you know i'm, I'm i i like to talk about it you know i i like to to hear about people's ways of you know thinking or feeling about the world and i'm also very very highly aware that you know the nature of of science is is to be disproved and um i'm aware of the limitations of of the technology and our brains and when it comes to basing what i do like on a daily basis i tend to go towards things that i have more of an air of certainty around Okay. Just in the in the way that I navigate and move through the world and interact with the world. But I, I, I I've looked into stuff and you know, the idea of consciousness is very under researched. It's very very difficult um to to really understand what, what consciousness is through a scientific lens because you know, you can only really go by what the definition is. Um and even so, like you know, is is how how does one generate consciousness? Like, is it something that the brain has? Is it is it a spirituality thing? Is it like a like a soul thing? Is it that there is just one kind of consciousness to the to the whole universe, and everyone just kind of tunes in from their own different perspectives? You know, I I very much like thinking about like you know what what could that be and. You know, it's it's very much something that I explore myself. It's just I think when it comes to like enacting myself in the world, it's just that I don't I don't consider that stuff, I guess. That's okay. One thing that I find to be interesting, there's this writer um named Rachel Polak. Mm-hmm. She has a book uh so you were talking about like the big five personality tests and things like that. I use astrology for a similar kind of effect, getting to know people, things like that. But anyway, this particular book is about tarot and Mm -hmm. she, she talks about, she has, it's very interesting. There's a chapter where she refers to specific work, or specific studies that Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli decided mm. to to look at in the 1930s. And I think it was a study of meaningful coincidence or what Jung terms uh, synchronicity. Mm. I've and heard that time. What was that? I've heard about synchronicity. Like a, a, th- there's some animes or like some films that i've watched that kind of center around the the idea of synchronicity and stuff i think it was actually this really non-spiritual anime about crazy like martial artists i think it's called like i think it's called baki okay cool (laughs) and it's it's a very gruesome physical fighty kind of anime thing Uh uh-huh Nothing, nothing, but they, they talked about synchronicity in that bit, and it's kind of like, go on, go on. I, I don't want to oh, no, stray fine. off into into that stuff, but... Um. Well, she basically says that, you know, we look at modern science, which is driven by empirical and observable causality, right? Mm. Mm. And we often say like, oh, it's an opposition to something like tarot or esoteric systems, 
based on interpretations like intuition, archetypes, synchronicity, things like that. (laughs) But she's saying, well, actually, maybe there's some connection between the two that we aren't uh, readily familiar with or seeing. So she addresses in this book the uh, disjunction between basically like common sense dictated by science and then more of an intuitive understanding that we can receive from practices like doing tarot readings or looking at your birth chart through astrology and understanding the stars. And her, I guess her position is that both realms of thought can exist in harmony or can kind of coexist together. Oh, definitely. Like it's, you know, it's, (laughs) it's, it's not like that they, they, hmm. because it's about like, when we look at like randomness, right? Hmm. There's something that there's this quote she has where she says like, outside i'm trying to think of like the actual quote but i think it's um something along these lines it doesn't matter if you're doing tea leaves or if you're i ching if you're throwing dice or if you're doing random tarot cards whatever it is you are cutting through human logic to get to a universal logic and whether you call that god or your higher self or something beyond us it's reaching into some other higher source and getting answers from it. And so at least that's kind of my personal philosophy on things is that sometimes our own minds can deceive us or can just keep us in a limited loop, (laughs) so to speak, and Mm. that there is some higher consciousness outside of that that we can tap into. Sure. I mean, I think with, with things like tarot and astrology it's you know i i've i'm i'm aware of it i like i've had tarot readings before i've watched a lot of stuff on on astrology and tarot readings and th- things of that nature i think it's it's definitely not something that that i believe in like um i i i i uh relate to to the ideas of like greater spirituality and, and consciousness and that we can't always understand things through i guess a, a scientific lens but i think that there's i think i think it in terms of like the utility of it for for life you know you know to to some degree science is or, or the scientific method is is about ruling out randomness with things and trying to understand things on like a broad scale. And it's, it's, you know, from reading and watching stuff and and hearing people kind of debate stuff like uh, astrology and, and tarot, it, it doesn't really feel to me like there's any compelling evidence to show that, that it has any application for for life i i i'm i hope i'm not like overstepping my boundaries or anything your boundaries or anything but it's um it's not something that i feel or th- think is is like applicable to to life i guess well let me ask you this <laughs> just go, to counter- for it, counteract for it. so yeah. <laughs> if if there are so-called masculine or feminine energies in the universe. And I, I'm not talking about like gender here necessarily, but just passive. The ideas of masculine and f- feminine energy. Like exactly. the chaos and con- chaos and order, order. kind of uh, yin mm. and yang. You know, I, I very much believe in that. And so how how I would describe what you just said is like then that the scientific method would be the masculine side of things, right? Sure. And then the chaos is like where the creative comes from, where we birth ideas out of chaos, out of confusion, out of more of it's the like passive freedom, isn't energy. It? It's, it's... Exactly. And and so for, for me personally, how I see tarot or anything like that is it's 
it is very meaningful, but in a very personal way. So if I do a reading for myself, I, I absolutely feel the benefits of it. But in the same sure. way that it's not scientifically conclusive, if that makes sense, you know, I, I me uh, having a specific routine that's good for me might not be good for you. And that, that's, you see what I'm getting yeah. at or like, no, I, I know. I, 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 d- I do. I understand. It's like, you know, sometimes when you when you don't kind of feel like there's any rhyme or reason or direction to things, I think having something to to follow or something to um, provide input on something that that can't really be explained is obviously going to be quite useful. I guess mm-hmm. in a, in a certain way. Can I, I think? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go. Go on. Oh, I just wanted to read you this quote really fast Go for from it. C.S. Go for Lewis it. from, I think, The Four Loves. Um, my friend had posted the other day, and, and I feel like it's relevant to our conversation. Uh, friendship is unnecessary, like philosophy, like art. It has no survival value. Rather, mm-hmm. it is one of those things which gives value to survival. And so I guess that's how I would... Yeah, that would be my interpretation of of these things of whether it's tarot or poetry or anything that, you know, doesn't have like objective meaning. Uh, subjective meaning, I guess, can be meaningful. Yeah. I think I I know that there's there's I think stuff around astrology, I think sometimes it can be quite vague in a certain way that it can be applicable to a lot a lot of people like a like particular and i understand that that you know obviously there's different parts of astrology like it doesn't all come from like one person and one like you know there's lots of different people who do it and i I suppose i'm just interested because my like sign my astro astrological sign um, i feel like I, I understand, like that, that that fact of it kind of being sort of generally applicable to people, but I, I do definitely feel like the sign that I have and the things that are said about my sign are like very like def- definitely like applicable to me and like who I, who I am and how I see the world and things of that nature. As opposed to the other ones that I've that I've read um, or, or looked into. Cool. Have you uh, ever had a birth chart done? <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't. I'd be, I'd be interested in having one though. That would be that would be interesting. My uh, my my sign is a is Aquarius. Um, I'm a, I'm nearly a Pisces, so I'm like awesome. I think I think someone someone told me once that that was supposed to be like the Aquarius aspect of being quite kind of perhaps a bit like seeing all the all the pain in the world or something. Mm-hmm. I, I I can't I can't remember exactly what they were talking about. Would you be able to give me like a an idea of what like an Aquarius person would be like? <laughs> whether whether it's something that I would. I would say very philosophical, thoughtful, kind-hearted, perhaps attracted to someone's mind first upon meeting them, and a nurturing person, someone who is supportive and cares about others, maybe a natural storyteller. And not a natural, well, I I identify with all of them apart from the storytelling, I'm not, not the best for that. I'm working on it. <laughs> cool. And yeah, with the birth chart, it'll give you multiple signs. So like your so there's your sun sign, which is what I'm I think you're talking about, but then you also have your moon sign and your rising yeah. sign, for example. So mine is Sagittarius is my sun sign, my moon is in Gemini, and my rising sign is in Virgo. And your rising sign is how other people perceive you when they meet you. So Virgo right. I'm like very much attention to detail uh, with that. It would make me a good editor, for example. 
but Sagittarius, my sun sign, makes me like the ambitious philosopher who loves to travel and is an adventure. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just kind of like the dichotomy between the different ones. You say, because I don't don't, sort of think of myself as either of those descriptions. (laughs) Okay, that makes sense. (laughs) And let's see, someone else described it to me recently as it's like your thumbprint when you were born on the planet. You're uh, psychological, but... Yeah, kind of like an outline of 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 who you are, but then obviously, you know, we're different too. But but I like it as a or I liken it to an archetype like Carl Jung says, you know, we have like mm. these these kind of ancient patterns, right? And so that's I guess as a storyteller, that's kind of my interest in astrology is like looking at those yeah. patterns that helps me become a better writer, it helps me understand the world a little bit better. Yeah. I I have looked into kind of like the archetype stuff, and I think, you know, the the archetype of like the hero I think is is something that resonated with me. Like I'm not, I'm not saying it in like a narcissistic way. I, I mean, like for my own kind of personal journey with things, it's like a lot of my life has felt very much like I am fighting constantly. Like I'm. You know, fighting to 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 help people or pr- protect people in in certain ways, and um, you know, taking on the burdens of things in in my life. And I know th- I think that was quite quite helpful for me t- trying to like understand or or give me some level of direction with me and like feeling okay with the the negatives that are, that. Are have occurred or, or are occurring. Can we talk a little bit about that? You, um, I think you'd asked me about why autistic people might be drawn to philosophy. I'm just curious. Yeah, 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 sure. Because um, I, th- I think when we when we were chatting, I mean, you know, I mean, f- for me, I think there there are kind of these. I think we we came up with like three different separate things, like. Mm-hmm. The rituals around it. Oh yes, uh-huh. you know, having the routine, the rituals, certainty and framework. Yes. You know, going through life, it's very important for us to understand things and the things that are not so easily definable and certain, like social interaction, right. <laughs> understanding people and emotions, tend to be a bit harder for us. And then, you know, last day I think we were saying about like the interest. Or like the special interests of understanding like the complexity of life and stuff. So which which one would you wanna talk on? Maybe let's see, the first was rituals, the second was Certainty and framework. The framework is interesting to me too. Mm-hmm. And then what was the third again? The interest in the complexity of life. Yeah, the last two, I guess. Yeah. Last two. Go for it. Oh, <laughs> for me first. Okay. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess I could just speak to me personally. And and my brother is also on the spectrum. I think my my father might have been as well. Got those genetic yeah, genetic he, ties. <laughs> yeah. I asked him actually, my brother and I both asked him, we were like, would you ever go get tested? And he just smiled at me and he was like, No. <laughs> I'm like okay i'm still working on it with my dad he's kind of right. he's open with it at this point but um that's great it, he's, not, he's not got any like drive to go get a diagnosis he's you know he's in his 50s and he feels quite stable in his life he doesn't really have any issues so it's understandable i guess that makes sense just one thing i will say that connects with i guess personally my brother and i both have a, a ability or a way to see or to form patterns and connections between things that maybe Mm. other people might not see an inherent pattern. I relate. Mm. You relate to that. Yeah. It's the whole pattern, pattern recognition stuff around autism. It's, it's very, um, very interesting. So that lateral thinking, I think. Okay. Okay. Some people define it as like thinking laterally between different concepts and, things and making connections and all that interesting 
there's a lot uh, that I'll have to ask you for references because I I'm certainly interested in reading and learning more about it. Mm-hmm. I think that, and then also just making sense of the world as much as we can, having my own dedicated personal philosophy or ethos. I mean, mm-hmm. I think Thomas Jefferson did this. It was Thomas Jefferson, or maybe it was, I forget who it was, but I've thought, I think he rewrote the Bible and took out all the magical bits <laughs> or the New, Interesting. New Testament or something. Yeah, right? To apply just the basic moral ethics the of Ju- it. Jude- Judeo-Christine values. And I guess I seek to do the same in my own way to take different truths that I've learned from different belief systems and my own experiences and things like that and kind of put together my own format for Mm. what it means to live a good life, be a good person, make an impact in the world, that kind of thing. And, oh, wow. Yeah, I think maybe I'm forgetting. <laughs> Sorry. I think I have it's to okay. have it it's, in it's front fine. of it's... me. Oh, here we go. Yeah, the complexity of life. Mm. Yeah, so that, I guess, I just answered my own question on the, on the second one about certainty and framework. It's like, I want to have my own framework that's in, individual, and that goes back to being an existentialist, is that I'm personally responsible for my own views too. And so it's like making it my own as a creative person, creating my own ethos or my own doctrine, so to speak, in a way, or philosophical views taking from different people that I've been influenced by over the years. And I just want to mention like Eric Fromm, his reflections on love. I really recommend his book, The Art of Loving. If you get a chance to read it, it's great. I think he's an atheist and a socialist. Michael Foucault, uh, Michel Foucault, his dissection of power structures has been influential in my life. Henry David Thoreau and J.S. Mill on personal freedom and liberty. And then transcendentalists like Walt Whitman, the inherent goodness of the individual the wonder of nature and that's had a profound impact on my views on the natural world and I guess our relationship to it as humans. And then William Blake, his poetry, his uh, exploration of themes like innocence or good and evil, humans relationship with the divine. And lastly, uh, Hildegard of Bingen. She was like a Christian mystic, but she was also Mm -hmm. a poet, a healer. What else did she do? Composer, philosopher, mystic, visionary, medical writer, and practitioner during the Middle Ages. So, wow. Anyway, (laughs) sorry, that was a lot of info dumping, but I guess. No, no, no. It's it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you go back in kind of history and time and stuff, it's the the lines between science and religion and spirituality and like, you know, things like things like alchemy and stuff are very like one in the same to a certain extent. Yes. Like it's uh it's it's interesting. Like Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean That would be my life's think, work. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think philo- philosophy for me is is definitely it definitely came out of my my experiences, you know, as I said, trying to trying to understand the world, why why things were happening to me and other people that that weren't good, you know, going into in, into philosophy or or at least just thinking about life in in solitary on my own. It was important for me because, you know, I I felt very much like I was, you know, out in the water, like I didn't really feel like there was any rhyme or reason to anything and it was very very difficult to i guess withstand the negatives that were happening in my life 
without having some kind of guided understanding of things or certainty around certain things. So that's, that's definitely why I, I guess, gravitate towards philosophy. I don't have any particular rituals that I do. I know that, you know, that the whole idea of autism and routine, some, sometimes having rituals allows you to have a set time in the day to, I guess, think or feel or, or do a certain thing which is positive for your, for your mental health. And just thinking about it now, I've, I think I probably do have some rituals that I do, which are not like, I had something in my head, which is just completely flown away. Do you have any nighttime but, um, rituals or anything or morning rituals? I think particularly when, it, when I'm struggling with something that is to do with experience, like um, my recent kind of breakup with my my long term partner was obviously quite quite impactful um, to a certain extent. You know, for, for me, my 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 rituals come in like where where I put my emotional energy, like when and where. Like I give myself time to think about certain things. So, you know, I set a time particular times in, in the day or sometimes when I'm going through a lot of emotional turmoil where I'm sort of dividing my 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 thoughts or my or my feelings you know you, you the the idea of processing things and processing events and emotions and stuff is very important and it's something that you you kind of need to do but at the same time processing all of it all the time throughout the day all the time is is equally not good for maintaining your life and your productivity and you know actually living and <laughs> not right. just just living in negative feelings um and so for me setting time aside where i am allowing myself to to think and feel about that that stuff and then closing off that for the for the rest of the day or something it's 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 important for me and you know that that kind of draws on the idea of alexithymia because for me emotions are not easily recognized or identified it used to be a lot worse nowadays it's a bit easier um but actually leaning into possible feelings or thoughts that i have um helps me be aware of what i'm feeling and and helps me kind of connect my feelings to certain events or thoughts which I, I find very, very helpful. You know, I might play some emotional music, which is related to it. And, Good. you know, I think, I think that's, that, that could probably be some, some level of a ritual, I guess, with, with things. And it's been very helpful for me. Sounds like it. Sounds like a good ritual. <laughs> and I say in, in terms of philosophy or philosopher, you know, I think um, the idea of positive nihilism resonates with me probably the most of anything i do very much like all the existential stuff and you know obviously friedrich nietzsche the father of nihilism is quite a, a big impact on me um i've read a few books i'm very i'm very bad with names and people and describing what people have done and what people have said to to their names uh, but i have read a few books and there was one called like the existentialist cafe which was quite interesting for me awesome. um it's kind of getting all of these philosophers together and having them discuss things and yeah, you know, it was it was really, really, really interesting. I'm very aware of the time and I, I know that you probably have a lot lot of different things to do. Uh it's getting quite late for me. I probably have to have some some food to refuel my body after after my gym workout earlier. So I guess I guess try, trying to round things up, I mean Yeah, of course. Usually the, there is a segment to what I do. It's it's called uh, Song of the Day. Should really be called Son of the Week because it is a weekly podcast, but hey ho. Um it's today today. So it is the song of the day today. <laughs> cool. Um do you have a, a, a song that kind of either means something to you or I guess relates to the topic of the podcast that you'd like to add to the the growing Spotify playlist? 
Sure. I like Peace Train by Yusuf or Cat Stevens, as he was known before. And I did want to ask if I could read a short quote from a poem. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. And so the poem I found, it's actually, it's actually in Dasaka Akeda's book, The Heart of the Lotus Sutra, about Buddhism, but, but it's also one of my favorite poets that he quotes. So, One self I sing. With these words, Walt Whitman begins his paean to humankind. Leaves of grass. Whitman, his words full of strength and conviction, sings, In all people I see myself. None more and not one a barley corn less. I know I am solid and sound. I know I am deathless. I know I am august. I exist as I am. That is enough. That's a beautiful, beautiful string of words. Thanks. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. (laughs) It's probably not the best way to characterize that, but um, hey The poem, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, a beautiful string of words. No, it's. Um, I think w- with a bit more time to kind of digest and feel that. I I I very much like poetry. I think it's. If I had more time in my day in life, I think I would definitely want to pursue more of the the arty side of life in the, in that sense. But uh, yeah, so um, I I will put peace train by. Yusuf or Cat Stevens in the Vordi uh, playlist. Um, are there any links or things that you would like to share with people that you would like people to to go to? Uh, anything that you? Sure, on all the social medias and things like that. It's just I go by my full name, so Emily Robin Clark on Instagram. Sure. Emma Dream Music on Instagram is my musical name my pseudonym Mm -hmm. and then also the imdb and what else my website is just emilyrobinclark.net cool yeah do you have a link tree i do you do okay cool well i i will put the link tree down in the comments of this video whether you're on youtube or whether you're on any of the podcasting streaming services Thank uh, you. you can find that below alongside my personal link tree uh if you want to help support the podcast the best thing that you can do is rate it on any of the podcasting streaming services that you are using at the moment uh give it a follow um if you want to get updated about new podcasts that are coming out uh, i try to get them out over on, on monday around about 5 a.m uh british standard time now so and if you, if you also want to stay up to date with the work that i do uh, you can head over to my Instagram at Thomas Henley UK, where I do but daily blogs, uh, reels, things of that nature, and also updates on on the podcast and how things are going. So I definitely encourage you to go check that out. And um, if you are on YouTube, make sure to like, uh, give it a sub. Same same thing as the follow thing. If you want to get updated about things that are happening, absolutely. I love and your comment podcast. down below. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah go check all that stuff out uh sponsor of the podcast dbuds is also in the link tree if you want to get 20 percent off a uh, very special link for the 40 audio listeners uh really great noise um reducing earbuds that you can adjust the candlelight loop but uh, a little bit different and they've been really helpful for me in situations where i'm not wearing my noise cancelling earbuds where they've gone out of charge or something so yeah Last question, Emily. Have you enjoyed your 40 audio experience? Absolutely. It's been amazing. And I've been listening to your podcast before I go to sleep at night, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I, I, I really great. like to, to hear stuff like that because it's, it's, I think sometimes as a creator, it's kind of, you kind of feel in a, in a sense of isolation or like you're just producing stuff and it's not really doing anything <laughs> yes. that makes sense yeah. until someone tells you about it so it's um it's thank you for that you're welcome i've been learning a lot too so thank you awesome for your awesome. work and uh with that i hope you all have a very lovely day and i will see you next week
for another episode of the 40 Oti Podcast. See you later, guys.